Catherine Enos, welcome to Talk Python to Me. Hey. Hi, it's Michael. great to be back. Yeah, it's great. Great to have you here. Enos, you've been here a bunch of times. Catherine, have I had you on before? Yeah, I think so. A I, while think, ago I think so as well, but it's been a really long time, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Indeed. well, it's, it's great to have you back. I feel like this is a very Berlin-focused podcast today. <laughs> <laughs> Just unrelated, both of you happen to be there, so that's, that's really cool. Thank you for taking time out of your evening to be part of the show. Of course. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to talk about machine learning, some of the rules and regulations come, come in around there, especially in Europe. We're going to talk about uh, fairness. We're going to talk even a little bit about sort of interesting indirect implications like Google or not Google, uh, GitHub Copilot and, and these types of things. We'll, we'll sort of go through the whole ML space and talk about some of these ideas. But you both are doing very interesting things in the machine learning space. Let's sort of just get a little bit of your background. Catherine, tell people a bit about what you're doing these days. Yeah, I'm um, here in Berlin and focused on how do we think about data privacy and data security concerns in machine learning. So for the past five years, I've worked on the space of how do we think about problems like anonymization, differential privacy, as well as how do we think about uh, solutions like encrypted learning and building ways that we can learn from encrypted data. So it's been really fun and uh, I'm excited, but first first to publicly announce here that um, I'll be joining ThoughtWorks in January. Um, yeah, that's to, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> as a, a principal data scientist, their focus exactly on this problem, um, which they've been noticing here in Europe is how do we think about data privacy and data security problems when we think about machine learning? Um, it's a growing concern, so it should be pretty exciting. Yeah, a company like ThoughtWorks is one of these companies that works with other companies a lot and it's sort of this consulting side of things. And I feel like you can have a, a pretty wide ranging impact through those channels. Yeah, Do you yeah. Think, yeah. Do you think that being in Germany, there's more focus on these kinds of things in, in Europe, but especially in Germany, it seems like, than a pair, like say, in the US? Does the U.S. have more of a YOLO attitude towards <laughs> privacy and um, machine learning stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think just from a regulatory aspect, since we saw a passage of the GDPR, which is the big European privacy law in 2018, uh, that it went into effect, we definitely saw kind of a growing a trend here in Europe overall, I would say like actually France and, and the Netherlands have done quite a lot of uh, good work, even uh, Ireland at uh, questioning, let's say larger tech usage. But the activism, I would say on the ground activism here in Germany from the Chaos Communication Club and other types of activists that are here has been quite strong, which is um, exciting yeah. to see and therefore I think leads kind of ends up being in the headlines maybe a bit more <laughs> internationally. <laughs> also, actually, a fun fact, the story I always like to tell Americans is that, like, if you go on Google Street View here in Berlin, it's an awesome, um, I don't know, time travel <laughs> because the data there, it's, like, over 10 years old now. So you can read that. And Berlin is heavily gentrified now. So you can really see, wow, how did my neighborhood look 10, 12 years ago? Because yeah. Google did it once. They never came back because everyone wanted their, their, their buildings pixelated. Um, and they were like, okay, fuck this, uh, Germany's <laughs> too difficult. We're never going to send our cast to here again. <laughs> so, you know, I definitely encourage you to use Google Street View in Berlin. It's, it's really fun from like a historical perspective. How, how funny. Yeah, so you can go and, and basically say, I want my house uh, fuzzed out so you can't see details yeah. about my, my personal Yeah, residence. and a lot of buildings will look like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I went to my place on Google Maps, you, you can see it evolve over time and like, oh, that's when I still have that other car before it broke down or crashed or, or whatever. Uh, and I can sort of judge how old the pictures are by, you know, is it what, what season is it? Or what's in the driveway or what's the porch look like? What kind of, uh, you know, chairs do we have? There's all sorts of detail. Like none of it's obscured. Right. There's a there's a fun fact that some researchers worked on in the U.S. of could they do the census just via Google Street View? And they found there was a heavy correlation between census data and the makes of cars that people had in their driveway. 
So oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh, wow. it's a good it's an interesting paper. Yeah. I think yeah. actually Tim Timnike Bru might have been on that paper as well. Um, the kind of very well known uh, machine learning ethics researcher who's now running her her own organization in the space. Anyways, it's a really cool paper. I'll see if I can find it and send it to you for the show yeah, notes. Yeah, we could yeah, put in the show notes. Awesome. All right. Well, congratulations on the ThoughtWorks thing. That's really cool. Enos. Uh, yeah. How about you tell people about yourself as well? It's It's been almost a year, I think, maybe since I had you on Talk Python. Yeah, I but, think it was uh, the year, year in review. I was in Australia at the time. It was summer. Uh, exactly. Now I'm in Berlin. Now it's winter. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, still, I'm still the co-founder of Explosion. Um, we, we're probably most known for our open source library, Spacey, which is an open source library for natural language processing. And um, one of the main things people do with our stack is built um, NLP and machine learning ap applications. We also publish an annotation tool called Prodigy, which allows um, creating training data for machine learning models and all our work and everything we do is very focused on running things on your own hardware, data privacy. Um, and that's also um, something that's very important and something that we see our users and customers do. So people want to train their own models and they naturally think about how do I create my data? What do what do I do to make my model good? What do I do to make my application work? Um, and so this all ties in quite well with other questions about like, okay, what should I do? Um, how should I reason about uh, my data? Which we also see as a very, very important point. And I actually think this can even prevent a lot of problems that we see if you actually just look at your data, think about what do I want my system and my pipeline to do? How do I break down my problem? And that's kind of, that's exactly what, um, yeah, the type, the tools we're building, uh, um, hopefully helping people to do. Yeah, fantastic. So you have Spacey and then you have some, that's the open source thing. You also yeah. have some products on top of that, right? Yeah, exactly. So we have uh, Prodigy, if you scroll down a bit here, um, you're pulling up yeah. the page. Yeah, exactly. Prodigy, that's um, an annotation tool and we're currently working on an extension for it that um, is a bit more like a SaaS um, cloud tool, but has a private cloud aspect. So you, you can bring your own hardware, you can run your code, your data on your own um, cloud resources. So no, da no data, nothing has to leave your service. And that's something that people already find very appealing about Prodigy. You can just download it, run it. Um, it doesn't send everything, anything no. across um, over the internet. Um, I, yeah, I, that's I really love that. Keep doing. You all are, yeah, I love that you all are embracing that because there's such you know, we'll get into this later, uh, not the first topic, but it, it's related. So I'll just talk a bit about it. I really like that you're not sending the people's data back because if they're going to trust your tools, they need to know that you're not sharing data that is either part of their competitive advantage or they have to protect for privacy reasons. I recently started, got in the, um, the GitHub Copilot trial and I installed that and it said, or, you know, preview, whatever it's called. And they said, oh, you just have to accept this agreement where it says, if you generate code from us, we're going to get some analytics. I'm like, ah, all right, that's fine. Whatever. I ask it how to connect to SQL Alchemy because I forgot. It'll just tell me. Oh, and if you make any edits, we're going to send those back. Wait a minute. What if one of the edits is put my um, AWS access key in there because it needs to be there or, you know, for a little not thing that I'm going to publish, but but it's still it's still going back, right? So there's a lot of things, and I just uninstalled. It. I'm like, you know what? No, this is this is just too much to yeah. risk for too little benefit for me in, in my world. Yeah, I think we also see a lot of it is also kind of pointless. I think there used to be this idea that like, oh, you can just like collect all the data, and then at some point you can do some magical AI with it. And I think for years this used to be the classic pitch of every startup. Like, I don't know, it's almost used to be what we work pitched in some weird way. It's usually like, oh, we yeah. do X, and then we collect data, and then it's dot dot dot, and then it's AI, and then it's profit. <laughs> Um, and that, that used to be <laughs> how people like map out their business plan. I think this has changed a bit, but I think you can still see some of the leftovers where, you know, companies are like, oh, we might as well get as much data as possible because maybe there's something we can do with it. And they, yeah. you know, we, we've always seen working in the field that like, nah, I don't want, I don't want your annotations. Um, yeah. Like Absolutely. there's no, literally no advantage I get from that. So I might as well yeah. set up the tool so that you can keep them. That's perfect. And uh, Catherine, Mr. Hypermagnetic says, oh, I thought KJM and Stan was a hip new tech stack. 
<laughs> and now it's uh, it's my company name. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, right it's like a good inside joke that lives on many many decades later. I love it. All right. Well, let's kick things off with some regulation, and then we can go and talk more things uh, about uh, maybe some other laws. We can talk about things like Copilot and other stuff. But I did say this was a, a European focused, at least kickoff to the show here. So I think one of the biggest tech stories out of the EU in the last couple of years has got to be GDPR, right? Like that's, I still heard. Just yesterday, people talking about, well, this because of GDPR and because we're doing that and this company is not, right? There's still just so much uh, awareness of privacy because of GDPR. And I I do think there are some benefits and I think there are some drawbacks to it, but it certainly is making a difference, right? And so now there's something that might be sort of an equivalent on the AI side of things, right? I mean, not exactly the same, but that kind of regulation. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's interesting because it's been a work in progress for some years, like the GDPR was. So the initial talks for the GDPR started, I think, in like 2014, 2015, didn't get written until 2016, went into effect in 2018, um, and it's still a topic of conversation now, many years later. Um, some pluses, some minuses, right? We can talk about how GDPR was intended versus how we've seen it rolled out across the web, which is uh, yeah, quite different than what was intended, obviously. Sure. Um, but I think that's always a problem with it, with a lot of regulations and the EU in general. You see, like, you know, I'm very pro-regulation. I think the idea of GDPR is great, but of course, you know, once um, a large um, organization like the EU rolls things out, it can kind of... Uh, yeah. Go a bit wrong here and there. Well, let me yeah, just say, like, let me set a little foundation about why I, I sort of said I think there are some negatives. I think the the privacy stuff is all great. I think the ability to export your data is great. I, the ability to have it erased, to know what's being done with these are all good things. I feel though that it disproportionately was difficult for small businesses, um, but was aimed at places like Facebook and Google and stuff. So for example, for like my courses and stuff, I had to stop doing anything else for I was almost two weeks and rewrite a whole bunch of different things to to make to comply and I to the best of my knowledge, I'm doing it right. But who knows? Um whereas Facebook didn't shut down for two weeks. <laughs> you know, they they had a however, small team who did however. it right. Yeah, well, no, they had quite a bit of and only as a entry. only as a percentage, only as a percentage of total employees. I mean, small. But they actually had to shut down several products that are no longer available in Europe that are available in other jurisdictions. Okay. And also, when we look at who's been fined, it's been predominantly the fangs sure. and other. Yeah, I, I do think that the enforcement is is focused on the fang side yeah. of things. Yeah. Yeah, which so it's like, you know, which is basically what most folks said when it went into enforcement is like, yes, we believe these are things that everybody should be doing to better look after the security of sensitive data, regardless of, you know, the provenance, so to speak. But also, we intend to employ this legislation to look after these problems, right? And mm -hmm. everything that Max Scrums has been doing um, who's he's based here in Germany and he's been uh, filing quite a lot of amazing lawsuits um, against a variety of the fangs and been getting some interesting rulings, let's say, from the European courts. Yeah, good. Enos, how was the GDPR for you before we get to the next law? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> explosion. Um, was it a big deal? Um, not so much because I think actually already our, our standards were such that like we weren't really doing um, anything that was, uh, you know, violating or intended to violate, mm. you know, what then became GDPR. Like, I think it was just, you know, we had to go through some things to make, I don't know, it's a, we've always, we've always intended to not have any cookies on our sites. So we sure. don't, um, at, in the first place. And then, you know, it's a lot, actually a lot of work to like, make sure that like, nothing you use tries to sneak some cookies in there. And then you're like, ah, I used the wrong URL here. Now I'm, I have all these YouTube cookies again. But um, yeah. I think in, in general, it, you know, we were already, even be, you know, before um, it came up or before we, um, you know, GDPR really came out, we realized that, oh, we're actually pretty compliant or like at least we already aim to be yeah. compliant. So we yeah. didn't have to do very much. 
I think I was too in terms of principle, but not exactly in practice. There were those types of things. Like, for example, I had the discuss comment section at the bottom of all the pages. And then I realized they were install they were putting double click cookies and all and Facebook cookies and all sorts of stuff. I'm like, wait a minute, I I don't want people who come to my page to get that, but I'm not trying to use it. Right? It's like this cascading chain, and yeah, like embedding YouTube videos. We go to a lot of work to make sure that it, like it doesn't actually embed YouTube. It does a thing that then allows you to get to the YouTube without the. Uh, yeah. Anyway, there's it's like that kind of stuff, right? But still, I think it's good. I think it's pretty good in general. But let's talk about machine learning and AI stuff. So I, I pulled out some highlights here. Let me maybe throw them out and you, you all can react to them. So we've got this article on techmonitor.ai called the EU's leaked AI regulation is ambitious but disappointingly vague. New rules for AI in Europe are simultaneously bold and underwhelming. Uh, I think they interviewed different people who probably... <laughs> have those opinions as, as you can see through the article it's not the same person necessarily it holds both those at once <laughs> so this is leaked but this was leaked in april 15th of this year and i think seven days later or something the actual thing was published so it, it's not so much about the leak just that the article kind of covers the details right this is still not unknown is it no, no, no. The full text is available and there's been a lot of good kind of deeper analysis from from variety perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Catherine, you want to give us a, a quick summary of what the, the goal of this is? Yeah. So I think, I mean, the, when I first got wind that this was going to be happening, I was uh, talking with some folks at the Bundesministerium intern, which is basically the intern German administration here. So mm. you think of like the, if we had a, in the U.S., sorry, U.S. centric, in the U.S., if we had like an, an office of Homeland Security and the interior and they were all together and they like also did like FTC like things, that's what it would be. <laughs> Anyways, um, so and they have a group called the Dot and Ethic Commission, which is Data Ethics Commission, and they had built several large reports on uh, thinking and analyzing about the risk of algorithmic based systems and algorithmic based decision making, um, which has been a topic of conversation, obviously, for a long time. Eventually, all of that, what I found out was that they were talking then with other groups in the EU about forming a regulation like this. And um, if anybody wants to read the German Dot and Ethic Commission report, which also is in, available in English, you can see that a lot of the ideas are kind of taken and transferred there, which is basically like when we think about AI systems, can we analyze the level of risk that they would have, let's say, in use in society? So you can think of very high risk being like bombing people and very low risk like... Um, Bombing you know. people like drones or or, or yes, self flying planes or absolutely. Um, I mean, we yeah. have drones that bomb people. That's yes, the thing that happens true. in the world. That is but what thing. is less less common <laughs> is that you just send the drone out and say, "Go find the, the quote bad people and take care of them." Right? There's still usually a person somewhere that makes a decision, and so I mean, we I don't think we want a world where we just send out robots to take care of stuff well, i think some some stuff. people want some people want that because it can be very um <laughs> nice to like you know absolve you absolve yourself of that responsibility yeah, yeah. you're the one pressing the button you have to answer for that and you know you have to take accountability if the machine did that well i mean it's kind of like this problem yeah. of okay whose fault is it if the self-driving car kills um, mm -hmm. a pedestrian yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, There's that's a true. really great uh, psychological theorem around that too um, called the moral crumple zone, which is basically talks about how the nearest human to an automated system gets blamed. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, it's like, well, why don't you do something? I don't know. The computer said yes. So, you know, it's, a, yeah. it's interesting yeah. psychology that yeah. we use to like judge people. Like yeah. you should have done I, I, I something. Did yeah, and I do think actually in the self-driving car example, I think a lot of people would actually say, yeah, the developer who built that system that made the decision to drive to drive forward and not stop is to blame. Um, 
So, you know, that does check it, out. Yeah. It could be. I, I really like the crumple zone analogy. I don't know if I'm receiving it correctly, but, you know, if you're in a car crash, like the radiator is going to get smashed straight away. Like that's the first thing when it caves in, but the driver back in the middle might be the one who did it in the software world. Maybe the equivalent is, yeah, the developer made that choice, but they made that choice because the, the CEO and the manager said, you ha we're optimizing for this and we don't care. We want to ship faster or we want to make sure this, this scenario is perfect. And they're like, you know what? That's going to have a problem when it gets snowy and we can't see this line. Like, you know what? This is what we're aiming for. And like, they, they don't necessarily make them do it, but they, they say this is really where you got to go. So a crumple zone, I like it. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I think that just to make sure it clear, the crumple zone was like that the driver would get blamed rather than the company <laughs> that produced the software. And so got like, it. or the operator of the radiology yeah, yeah. machine would get blamed like rather than the producers because mm -hmm. you kind of create this like trust, inherent trust, like, well, you know, like they're building a self-driving car. Clearly it's not their fault. It's the driver's fault. Why weren't you paying attention or something like this? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So for I really quickly, I, I just want to say none of us are lawyers. <laughs> so don't, don't take any of this advice and go do legal things. Talk to real lawyers. But uh, I do want to talk about the law. And so one of the things the article points out is these rules apply to EU companies and those that operate in the EU, and then what is way more broadly for tech companies or impact EU citizens, right? So if you have a website and EU citizens use it, or you have an app and EU citizens use your API and it makes decisions, probably this applies to you as well. Yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, we'll see in practice how it gets rolled out, but yeah, yeah, it's always about the case law afterwards, but in theory, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's about, yeah. it's, it's mainly about the, you know, documenting risk is, I guess, what I would say, like documenting and addressing risk. So um, one interesting thing about it, and I'd be curious to hear both of y'all's thoughts around it, is kind of bringing to the forefront the idea of auditing AI systems and what should be done to better audit and document problems in, in automated systems like AI systems or machine learning systems. Um, that I find quite interesting. Um, would be curious to hear y'all's take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think even, even fundamentally, I think that's also something that's pointed out in the article is that um, there's already this problem of like, how do you even, you know, define what, where an AI system starts, where it ends, what is the system? Is it the, just the component? Is it the model? Um, but by itself, the same model can be used in all kinds of different use cases, and some of them can be bad and some of them can be good. So it has to be the larger component. Um, but then, you know, also even where does AI really start? Like you could have a role based system that does the exact same thing. Um, is that like exempt for even if the outcomes are like pretty much identical? I think that's already right. where it gets pretty problematic. Um, and where uh, I, I think, think you also does. probably see a lot of people, um, you know, being able to get away with. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. The, the law seems to try to characterize the behavior of the software rather than the implementation or the technology of it. Right. It doesn't say, you know, when a neural network comes up with an outcome or something along those lines. And, and they talked about how the idea is to try to make it more long lived and more broadly applicable, but also, you know, that could result in ways to sneak around it. <laughs> Uh, you know, yeah. technically it's still doing what the law is trying to cover, but it, you know, somehow we built software that doesn't quite line up. Yeah. Yeah. And actually to get, yeah, to get back to this auditing question, I do, I do think this is, it's definitely the, a very interesting part of it. And I do think that also, it also shows that stuff like interpretability will become much more um, relevant and interesting um, or even more uh, relevant going forward, because I do think if, you know, we end up with a, with laws like that, um, companies will have to be able to either just explain internally why did my system make a certain decision or maybe even this has to be communicated to the user um, or to um, you know to citizen in a similar way of how with GDPR you can request your data maybe you can be able to request more information on why a certain outcome was produced for you or which features of you the system is using and I think that all that does require you know Sure. Um, 
the feature seems and, completely doable. Like it seems entirely reasonable to say, well, we used your age, your gender, and your income and your education level to make this decision. I think maybe more tricky is why did it make a deci decision? I mean, you you two know better than I do, but it seems really, I can sit down and read code and say, well, there's an if statement that if this number is greater than this, we do that. But it's <laughs> yeah, I mean, really hard to do that with neural networks, right? Yeah, and so, machine learning gets tricky because machine learning is always cold in data. And yeah, so it's kind of, it's this software 2.0 idea where even, you know, testing a system is much more difficult. Like if you're just writing straightforward Python code, you can then write a test and you can say, oh, if this goes in, this should come out. And if that's true, then yeah, you have a green test. And then- yeah, um, exactly. But I mean, but uh, it's, it kind of is a testament to the fact that we don't really test machine learning systems today yep. very well. Like we have uh, very, you know, early in the whole ML ops side of the equation. And I think one of the things, so first off is a lot of these audits, people think they're going to be self-assessments. So leave that to question mark of how a self-assessment is going to work at any type of scale. But then also they they put forward and one thing that I really liked about this law is they actually put forward things that people should be testing for, like security of the models, like the privacy of the models, like the interpretability of the models and so forth. And I would say that most places that are throwing machine learning into production today do not test for any of those things before. Yeah. <laughs> so no, I it's think like, mostly like, oh, some accuracy score and then maybe some feedback oh, from users. Good. And then it's good to go. Does it and I seem think like also, you know, a reasonable yeah. outcome? Okay, good. It's working. Yeah. And, and I think, but there's also a lot of, you know, we see this kind of disconnect if you go from academia to industry where like you know you can't like academia works differently you have very different objectives and that's great you're trying to explore new algorithms you're trying to um, solve problems that are really hard and then see what works best on them and um, you know rank different um, technical solutions and in industry you're actually shipping something that affects people and um, yeah if you just apply the exact same metrics that's um, you know that's just not enough what do you think about testing by coming up with scenarios that should should pass or not pass for example if you're testing uh some kind of algorithm that says yes or no on a mortgage for a house or something like that just say look okay i would expect that a, a single mom would still be able to get a mortgage so let's you know have a single mom apply to the model and see what you come up with these scenarios but like if it if it fails any of these it's it's unfair I mean, try it's, to give it's it a very example. idealistic. Is it possible? I mean, I don't want—I don't want to call it cute. Like, I, I, you know, it's a very idealistic view, and that's all very nice. But I do think I think I, I personally I see two problems with this. One is that a lot of you know AI systems are usually quite different. Not everything is as straightforward as like, oh, I have a pipeline here that predicts whether you should get a mortgage. It's often like lots of different components. Every company tries to solve very very different problems, so you can't like easily develop a framework where you know you have one input and one output. Usually, predicting the thing is one tiny part of sure. a much larger application and then also okay if you have like you know things like oh should someone get a mortgage should a private company give you a mortgage or not i think a lot of you know companies would find that oh maybe it's up to us whether um you know you get a mortgage or not there's no um you know there's there's no general framework for and i mean you know maybe with a, with a mortgage it's a bit different but there are so many applications where yes you can say it's really unfair but it's still you know, within the realms of like what a company would argue um, is, you know, up to their um, discretion. And I'm not, I'm not defending that. I'm just saying it's very, very difficult to say, oh, you're being unfair. It's not straightforward as my, my yeah, I mean, example. At least like in the US. Yeah, yeah. At least in the U.S., like there's actually laws for this. So like equal treatment or disparate treatment, we would say. So like there's actual mathematical, it's a statistical relationship, like 70 70 30 or 80 20 i think that you can show that there's disparate treatment so for example if you could prove that um there's that much of a difference if you're a single mother let's say versus other groups and you actually have a legal court case you can take the bank to court and you can sue them so there's some precedence for equal treatment at least in some countries and some jurisdictions and I think um, from, but from thinking about the mathematical problem of fairness, I mean, in all of the research that a lot of really amazing intelligent researchers have done is they've shown that um, fairness definitions and the choice of fairness and how you define it 
can actually be mathematically diametrically opposed. So depending on what definition you choose, and there's a whole bunch. So Arvin Narayanan and his group um, in the US have been doing a ton of research on this. There's a bunch of folks that have been doing research for more than a decade on this, all the fat ML people, the fairness, accountability, and transparency in ML conferences that run every year have been doing, again, two decades nearly of research on this stuff. But it's not a solved problem, even if, let's say, you choose a fairness definition mathematically, you measure the model, you have met that requirement. It doesn't mean that the, actually what you're trying to show in the world or what you're trying to do in the world from like how we humans would define fairness is yeah. what you've met, right? So, yeah. 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 yeah I Statistics think, um, and intuition are not necessarily the same, for sure. Yeah. Catherine, you had an interesting comment about uh, fairness is not the only metric <laughs> before we started recording. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the question, the question that I like to ask people is, let's say you're building a computer vision system um, to bomb people, to identify people and bomb the right targets. If you said it performed fairly, let's say in re relation to gender or in relation to skin color, to the darkness of your skin color, would that be an ethical or fair system? <laughs> yeah, it's a hard. It's not. It's certainly not an easy answer. Um, yeah, yeah. So there, there's more. There's more to it. So one of the things that's interesting about this law is that it, it talks about high risk. AI systems, and it refers to those pretty frequently through there. Um, so high-risk AI systems include those used to manipulate human behavior, uh, conduct social scoring, or for indiscriminate surveillance. Those are actually banned yeah. in the EU <laughs> according to this law, right? I mean, I guess you could you could almost read like you can you can by reading that you can read who this was written for and who um you know <laughs> you know who, who who they had in mind when they wrote that i think it's quite um you know it's quite clear what what types of applications and what types of companies um yeah yeah the social scoring stuff is really creepy um but yeah indiscriminate surveillance also and then it also talks about how special authorization will be requir required for remote biometric identification. This is, I'm guessing, types of biometric identification that you don't actively participate in, right? You don't put your fingerprint on something, but you just happen to be there. Uh, they call out specifically facial recognition, but I've also heard things like gait, the way that you walk, uh, mm. and, and, and weird stuff like that. Um, so it's not being like special your, authorization your will be required. Oh, yeah, you're even typing your, too, right? Your typing pattern is quite, um, yeah. or is more unique than you think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, even even more sort of old school fingerprinting, I'm always like amazed at what like um, can be done to like uniquely identify you on the internet, even without having any personal identifiable information. Yeah. Another thing that, that stood out to me, I thought was fun. Um, is that people have to be told when they're interacting with an AI system. So you have to explicitly say, um, hey, this thing that you're talking to here, this one, you're not talking to a human right now, you're talking to a machine. Yeah, we'll yeah. see if it gets rolled out like cookies. <laughs> 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 like, a big blurb of text that says there may or may not be automated systems that you interact with on this yeah, product. Yeah, because yeah. they also like, yeah, yeah, I think it's it's almost like, I don't know, like a classic disclaimer, because I think the way it's written makes probably makes people think more about like uh, conversational AI. But I do think it's this also covers everything else. And if, you know, you use some component that does some arbitrary predictions in order to I don't know, this can go like 20 levels deep, then you need this disclaimer yeah. on it. And then unfortunately, I think an unfortunate side effect of that will be that, okay, people are less likely to notice it because it will have to be on everything. Like, sure. you know, they even really yeah, small features you might want to have on your website that do use AI in some yeah. form or another. It seems totally reasonable, um, maybe unnecessary, yeah. but certainly reasonable. But yeah, you're right. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be like the cookie notices. You know, so if you go to say on Netflix and you go to watch a, a movie, well, that list of recommended for you, do you have to like okay this? Um, 
I'm not sure if I can find it. Yeah. Or maybe, uh, maybe a, it's just, it will just be a Netflix and it's like terms and conditions. When you accept those terms and conditions that most people probably don't even read, um, you will accept that, yes, everything you're interacting with here is AI. And um, yeah. By the way, yeah. here's a very long 20 page document about how we may or may not use automated <laughs> systems in your use of this website. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So have fun. Uh, you know, Let me know how the reading goes. <laughs> I said I thought I got, there was a lot of stuff that came out of the GDPR that was pretty good. Uh, the little this website may use cookies. That to me, mm. just the worst is is the yeah. worst. It's like, do you want to be able to log in, <laughs> or do you want to not be able to log in? Well, I want to be able to log in. Okay, we've got to use cookies. So I actually got this thing uh, called I don't care about cookies as a an ex browser extension. And if it sees that, it tries to agree to it automatically, like every time, just so to cut down on the the cookie. Okay, okay. By the way, this was by no means the intention of the law, just to make it clear to everyone. <laughs> no, I think it's, 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 it's important it. to bring that up because also, you know, especially I think, uh, yeah, from the European perspective, you know, I'm genuinely a fan of GDPR and then often yeah people go like oh it's all these cookie pop-ups and now it's like yeah no that wasn't that's not GDPR. I, the cookie that's pop just, the cookie pop-ups yeah. predated the gdpr didn't it it was mainly roll so some people did it before but it was deeply rolled out for gdpr because there's yeah. all this compliance now a tip for folks um is a, somebody got sued it was Google or Facebook, that it was too hard to just uh, do the least possible. So now if you are if you haven't installed this extension, there's usually a big button that says legitimate interest and you can just press that one, it's the least amount. Um, yes, does yeah. it usually now involve two clicks rather than one? Yes, um, yeah. but the I wonder goal, if this extension yeah. does it, because I think as far as I know, it's also, if you get to a set, if it offers you to go to a settings page, everything has to be unchecked by default. So exactly. it's actually, yeah, it's actually quite convenient. You just go to the button that's not accept all, and then you accept whatever is there, and then you get nothing. It might be this big and the same color as the page. So just be like really yeah, looking You gotta for highlight it. it, see if there's like a little, like a shadow. Which, is like, on. which just talks about, I don't know if you've talked about this on the podcast recently, but I've been reading a lot about dark patterns and like dark mm -hmm. patterns <laughs> and privacy are like in a very deep oh, yeah. love but relationship on the internet of like, no, you really want to give us all your data? Yeah, You're going to yeah. be the so dark sad if you and don't. The lack of privacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah at least with like the same color as, as foreground and background, that ties into another compliance thing, which is accessibility. And at least if like in the US, you can get sued for having a not accessible website, even, you know, companies will at least not do this, even if it's for, only if, if they don't care about anyone accessing their website and all they care about is not getting sued. You won't have uh, buttons with the same foreground and background color anymore. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Oh, yeah. And I'm I'm okay for my with my I'm okay with cookies, little clicker thing because I also have, uh, like, network level tracking blocking. Okay. So, <laughs> so that if then they say sure, well, fine. Here's your Facebook cookie. It's like no, it's blocked. So like, anyway, it's it's my weird setup. Uh, so Vincent out, <laughs> Vincent out in the audience yeah. says just to mention Raza, a Python tool for open source chatbots, took the effort or writing down some ethical principles yeah. of good design. And one of those is that it lists a conversational assistant should identify itself as one. Yeah. Oh, hi, Vincent. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> Raza is definitely, Raza is a great open source library as well. Um, we kind of, you know, space, friends with Spacey. It's kind of the same ecosystem. Yeah. And no, I think it's, it's, yeah, I think this is a good principle. Actually, you, often when I use like a, like a chat, a, a bot or whatever, and I'm not sure it's a chat bot, there are like a lot of, you know, things and ways of things you can write to check if it's a human or not, because they're like, you know, there's certain things where like, usually these things are quite bad at like resolving references. So, you know, if you use like a pronoun or like you um, to refer to something you previously said or to a person or something like it, right. it, there are a lot of things that often these things are quite bad at. And if you if you're vague enough, a human will always get it. But like um, a machine might not. So if you <laughs> use your uh, text yeah. processing 
ML skills and experience. To, yeah, no, because there was a, there was a case where I was like, this person, this this agent is so incompetent. It must be like it must be like a machine. And then it, it's actually it would be a pretty good chatbot because you know the chatbot passed as an incompetent human. Um, but uh, no, it turned out it was just an incompetent human. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, that's true. The the chatbots are very bad at at retaining, like building up a state of the conversation. It's like they see the message and then they respond to it. It's like you you ask a question and then it does it. Did you say, well, what exactly is, is this about? Well, I said it was about this above. So what do you think it's, you know, it's, it's just yeah, those Yeah, and I mean, these, these systems are getting, getting better at this, but there's just some like, you know, if you really try to be as vague as possible, um, you can like trick them and then you find out if it's a human or not. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so let's see some more things about the law is over here. The military AI in the military is exempt. So, uh, uh -huh. that's, that's yeah. not a surprise. I mean, there's probably I mean, top secret it, stuff. How are you going to submit that? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But then it's like, oh, you know, a lot of the worst things that happen happen in this context. So it's like, um, you know, as like, you know, as a little anecdote, for example, we've for a long time, we've always had, we've uh, at Explosion, we have this policy that we do not sell to organizations who are prim primarily engaged in government, military, um, or intelligence, national security, because, um, and our reasoning for that has always been that, well, in the, you know, free market, you have a lot of other ways that companies and applications can be regulated by regulations like this, but also just by market pressures and by things just being more public. All of these things you do not have if um, the work is uh, military intelligence or um, certain government work. So um, uh, we see that as very problematic because you have absolutely no idea what the software is used for and there's absolutely no way to regulate it ever. And yeah. then we say, okay, that's not who we want to sell our software to. Like the other use cases, you know, it's not, some government things are fine. You know, we have to sell to the IRS and um, equivalents or, um, you know, federal reserves. Or a lot, there are a lot of things that are like not um, terrible that are government adjacent or just a lot of research labs as well. But um, yeah, yeah, military, um, that's quite obvious. Yeah. Well, and then you think like how many companies um, that work on machine learning today that focus on selling explicitly into yep. the military and it's like, well, are they exempt because they're just, you know, basically an exempt, like is Palantir exempt from this? Oh, I'm interesting. Very curious. Right. Because <laughs> yeah, the law Primary. would otherwise apply to them, but, but sort of indirectly. Uh, so you're asking about transitive property basically. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like, well, exactly. it's only in use in military use, so it's probably okay. It's probably yeah. exempt or whatever, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I guess if you can make the case that it's, um, you know, it's classified, that that's probably your companies like that who have, um, you know, the means, they would make sure that every project they're taking on is classified in some way, and then, you know, they get around that. Yeah, that's probably true. All right, another thing that I thought was interesting, so uh, all the stuff we talked about so far is sort of, just laying out the details on the imprecision and subjectivity side. Uh, one of the quotes was one area that raised eyebrows is part of the report, which reads AI systems designed or used in a manner that exploits information or prediction about a person or group of persons in order to target their vulnerabilities or special circumstances, uh, causing a person to behave or form an opinion or take a decision to their detriment. Um, yeah, that's, that sounds like a lot of big tech, honestly, like a lot of the social networks. Um, maybe they even suggest maybe that's even like Amazon shopping recommendations, right? Encourage you to buy something that you don't need or whatever. What do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it, it, it's quite it's quite vague and it's like, OK, how do you define, you know, we have yeah. we'd have to wait for like the actual cases to come up and someone making the case that like, oh, I don't know, my, my wife divorced me because X happened and that was, you know, the outcome and it's clearly that company's fault and then someone can decide whether that's true or not and then um you know it's, it's quite and, and you know of course these are not cases that this was like designed for or written for <laughs> but like this you know it, it's it's it is vague to this extent yeah. where like yes this yeah. would probably be a legit case that a judge has to decide over and maybe the person would win um yeah wouldn't it be great if they gave examples I didn't... 
I didn't want to accept the cookies, so I'm suing <laughs> under the new law. Um, yeah, but no, that, like, that made me feel bad, yeah. But I mean, I think some of it um, is like really, uh, I feel like the conversation here, and I'm be curious to the opinion on the conversation in the US is around kind of the political ad manipulation and the amount, let's say, of when we think about topics like disinformation and misinformation, yeah. the amount of kind of algorithmic use of uh, let's say opinion pieces to kind of push particular agendas um i'm when i read this i'm guessing that's like one of the things they had in mind yeah. but uh, i had i had mis misinformation and fake news and all that kind of stuff is what yeah and i was also it. thinking of recommendation systems and like even i mean i don't know not even to fake news but like okay you can you know, manipulate people into, you know, joining certain groups. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah exactly. buying, buying things. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. You're Fine a stuff. relatively yes. just stable, normal stuff. person. <laughs> yeah. And then, <laughs> then you, you read some posts, they suggest you join a group three months later, you'll, you know, you're in the wilderness training with a gun or something. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's so easy to, to like send people down these, these holes, I think, you know, and on a much more relatable note, I would say, even though I really love YouTube, you know, one of the sort of sayings, I think I heard it somewhere, I don't know where it came from, so I can't attribute it, but you're never extreme enough for YouTube. If you watch three YouTube videos on like some topic, like let's suppose your washer broke. And so you need to figure out how does my dishwasher work? And so you watch several videos to try to fix it. Well, your feed is full of dishwasher stuff. And if you watch a few more, it's nothing but dishwashers there's a lot of other yeah. videos besides this Roger. So any little, like, it's almost like a, the butterfly effect, the chaos theory effect of like, I watched a little bit this way and then whoosh, you just, you end up down that, that channel. Yeah. And I think think? like what, one of the interesting things I think about that is I've been talking with a few folks and like where, you know, a friend's, you know, family has been kind of like radicalized around some of the topics that like say are, are very radical online right now. And they're like, I just don't know how it happens. And it's kind of like, well, the internet that they're experiencing is incredibly different than the internet that you're experiencing. And so yeah. it's kind of like when we think about lockdown or where the internet is going to be like a major source of people's life and then their internet is just a completely different experience than yours based off of some related search terms across maybe four or five different sites that have been linked via cookies or other types mm -hmm. of information. I mean, it's like, yeah, you can say, well, I have this experience, but if your entire world online was different, maybe you wouldn't have the same experience. I think it would be very hard to say what, how you would think and feel if you're entire information experience was completely different don't don't make me think about weird alternate realities of myself <laughs> what if, what if just one decision was made differently what would what world would you be in you know it could be really different honestly yeah. no and i mean you wouldn't even necessarily know and i think but i think that's also kind of a problem or i like in that sense i do like that it's relatively vague and i think laws can be vague because you know you don't know what's going to happen and you might have people who are in a situation where they don't necessarily feel like oh i've been like you know tricked or like treated badly here um, and maybe, you know, the outcome, maybe the outcomes of the behavior are bad, but, um, you know, maybe what the platform did wasn't necessarily illegal. Like, that's also the problem. It's like, you know, you can, what, like a lot of the content you can watch on YouTube is not, it's legal. And it's your right as like, you know, a free citizen, especially, you know, in the US where people take this um, even more seriously <laughs> to some degree than people in Europe, like you can, you can watch like anti-vax videos all day and that's your right and um it's nobody can keep you, you from can that it. <laughs> no it's, it's not good for you but like yeah. you know you, yeah, you can yeah. and um and so otherwise i think yeah if um you know with uh, terms that are maybe um you know less vague in that respect it would be much harder to actually you know go after cases where um yes it's clearly the platform is clearly to blame or the platform should be regulated which obviously you know I, I, it's very clear that this is what they had in mind Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I really like the part here that's like exploit information, target vulnerabilities, because it's kind of like, OK, I know these, you know, I mean, what we saw with Cambridge Analytica and then a bunch of the targeted stuff after that was like, 
we can figure out exactly how to target undecided voters of these different racial groups in these counties and we can like feed them as many Facebook ads as possible. And it's just like, wow, okay, I don't think people realize that that was um, so easy to put together and do given like a fairly yeah. small amount of information about a person. So, yeah. I mean, and, and it's not, it's not personal information, right? Because usually it's what we would call you know, profiles of individuals. So you fit a profile because, you know, you like these three brands on Facebook and you live in these districts and you're this age and, and this race or you report this race or we, we can infer your race because of these other things that you've liked. It means, you know, it adds a lot of information that I don't think most people know that, you know, that, they, that you can get that specific in the advertising world. Yeah. Yeah. How do you ladies feel about f the whole flock thing? Oh yeah, that, that Chrome was Chrome was doing to replace oh, yeah. cookies. I mean, we wouldn't even have to have those little buttons or my add-in. It would be a good world. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so I think that there's there's been a lot of important writing about flocks and and um, vulnerabilities in which just in so the people design. if they sorry if they don't yeah. know yeah oh sorry iterated, yeah, yeah, yeah. federated learning, learning of cohorts, of cohorts. yeah yeah yeah, okay. yeah yeah and federated learning is essentially a, a tool that can be privacy preserving but doesn't have to be um, and it basically means that the data stays on device and the things that we send um, to a centralized location or several centralized location are usually gradient updates. So these are small updates to the model. The model is then shared amongst participants and the process repeats. Um, the exact design of how Flux was rolled out and is rolled out is, I think, not fully clear. Um, and in general, I'm a fan of some some parts of federated learning, but there's a lot of loopholes in Flock's design that would still involve the ability for people to both reverse engineer the models, but also um, to fingerprint people. So yeah. to yeah. to take your cohort plus your browser fingerprint, you combine the two, it, it becomes fairly easy to re-identify individuals. So yeah. yeah, and I think the more underlying problem here is also that well, you know, are you going to trust something that comes out of Google that's marketed as like, <laughs> oh, it will like you know preserve your privacy and be like really great for you and the internet? And I mean, that's mm -hmm. <laughs> that's yeah, just like screens like, of uh, like red flags. <laughs> it feels like we've been presented a a false dichotomy. We could either have this creepy cookie world. Or because we must still have tracking, or we could have this flock. It's like, well, or we could just not have tracking. Like that's also a possible yeah. future. We don't have to have tracking, and here's a better tracking mechanism. We can just have not not have tracking. How about that? I was reading a wonderful article about IE6. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's young some, that's some young history. children. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm bringing up <laughs> ancient history, but there was a browser once, and it was called Internet Explorer Six. It was the bane of every web developer's existence for a yeah. long time. But one thing that I didn't know about it until recently is it actually had privacy standards built into the browser. You could set up certain privacy preferences and it would like block cookies and websites and wow. stuff for you automatically. Like Way in ahead all of its every time. web. And I was just, there was this whole standard oh. called P3P that with the WC3 put together around like everybody's going to have your local uh, stored privacy preferences. And then when you browse the web, it's just going to automatically block stuff and all this stuff. And I was like, we figured this out during IE6. What happened? <laughs> so yeah. yeah, just to let you know, a little bit of history. Look up P3P. So yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. I, I guess to close out the flock thing, the thing that scares me about this is if I really wanted to, I could open up a private window and I could go, I could uh, even potentially fire up a VPN on a different location and go visit a place. And when I show up there, no matter how creepy tracking that place happens to be, I am basically an unknown to that location. Whereas this stuff, if your browser constantly puts you into this category, well, you show up already in that category. There's, there's really no way to, to sort of have a fresh start, I guess. Uh, um, all right, so one thing, Enos, maybe you could speak to this since yeah. you're right in the middle of it, is um, that's, 
they talk about how one of the things that's not mentioned in here is you know how does it, it basically they say the regulation does little to incentivize or support eu innovation and entrepreneurship in this space like there's there's nothing in here in this law that specifically is to promote e, eu-based ml companies I mean, I guess I think also um, even. Well, does it even belong there, or is it, or is it okay? Or I mean, like, I don't know. I was actually I was a bit confused by that. It it does remind me of like well, in general, for a long time, a lot of people have said, oh, the EU is like a bad place for startups. Um, I think it actually regulation is a big part of that, which is sort of you know goes full circle. Like a lot of people find that well, the EU is more difficult. You have to stick to all of these rules, and people actually enforce them, and you're less free, and you can't do whatever the fuck you want. So you should go to the US, where people are a bit more like chill and it's a bit more common to like i don't know um ask for forgiveness later and just like do so i think i think that is definitely kind of a mentality that people have so i'm like i'm not sure honestly i'm not sure what like um um incentivizing um eu entrepreneurship could be I actually I mean for me personally like it was a very for me it was a very conscious decision for us to start a company in Berlin and the EU was like a big part in that. I know that like maybe you know I'm not the typical entrepreneur and I'm we're doing things quite differently with our company as well. We're not like you know your typical startup, but um, being in the EU was actually very attractive to us. And even you know recently as we sold um, some shares in the company, it was incredibly important to us to stay a German company and be. Um, a company paying taxes to the country that we actually incorporated in and not just become a US company, um, yeah. stuff like that. Good. But I know that's not necessarily true for like um, everyone. But are you um, maximizing yeah, that, shareholder yeah. value? No, I'm just kidding. I think, <laughs> I think <laughs> no, but I mean, yeah. that, that, that leads to so many wrongs that this short, short sighted thinking. I think that's that's great that you have. Yeah, but I mean, you know, you, the cap capitalism's gonna capitalism, like, you know, and, and, and I say that as like, you know, someone who is also participating in capitalism. Sure. And yeah, it's like, I mean, I, like, I don't know. I do think, you know, Europe is becoming more attractive as a location for companies. I think Berlin is becoming more attractive as a location to be um, based in and start a company. But it is also true that there are a lot of, I think, more general things that do, that make it harder to actually run a business here, especially if you directly compare it to the US. And yes, a lot of that is also the bureaucracy. It is a lot of the, you know, structures not being, you know, as um, developed. It's also, yeah, if you are looking to get investment in your company, um, it often makes a lot more sense to look in the US for that, um, which then causes other um, difficulties. If you, you know, especially a young company and you don't, you know, you can't have as many months, like in our case, we could be like, okay, here's, here's what we want to do. Um, if you're not in that position, you can't do that. And so I, like, I, I agree with like the problems here, but I don't know how um, this law and this uh, proposal. Yeah. Well, what what was it supposed to do, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, say, oh, you're sort of, you're exempt from some of the things if you are like, I don't know, <laughs> a startup <laughs> coming to the EU. <laughs> all right, here, like, here's, oh. how, here's, how it, here's how it advantages the, the EU. Like, all <laughs> companies that are not EU based have to have followed this law. And no rules for the EU. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Was, that wouldn't like be with the principles like of it, but right. The yeah, company I, I don't moving know what it would do. to the EU, you like get like you know you don't <laughs> only have to follow half of these things, and then you know you can you, you know then yeah. everyone's like back in like I don't know, um, yeah, having their like mailbox companies um, all over Europe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, one, I, I guess one other thing I would just want to touch on with this law. Speaking of what is absent. And, and this also surprises me a little bit is that there's there's nothing in here about climate change and model training and sort of the cost of operation of these things. Does does that surprise you? Would it belong here? What do you all think? I mean, is it a high risk? This is my ask. It's like when I saw it wasn't in there at all, not even lightly mentioned, I was like, 
how many like carbon emissions do we have to go until it's high risk? Uh, but evidently they're thinking of human side of high risk. Well, actually, climate change right. is also human side of the uh, direct uh, high risk. <laughs> like, maybe. It's, yeah. it's too many is steps. the AI going to kill me eventually <laughs> or tomorrow? Exactly. Um, is it yeah. armed or is it just, <laughs> is, it, is it like true. just 30 years from now when it floods or yeah. something? Yeah. 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 So yeah, I think like, it was, I was definitely curious to see that they didn't include it despite all of the kind of work here from the Greens and other parties mm -hmm. like them for, you know, climate change awareness when we talk about what is a risk, right? Obviously, there's a huge risk for it in the entire world, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I guess it also, it seems like may maybe it was too difficult to like, you know, implement in terms of how do we police that? Like, would sure. this then imply, I don't know, would AWS have to report to the EU about like who's using um, what compute um, yeah. and or I don't know report if the compute exceeds a certain limit so that then you can be audited like these could all be potential implications and um, which yeah. again then tie into other privacy concerns um, because yeah I would you know I, I wouldn't necessarily want like you know AWS to snoop around my compute yeah. um, but maybe they yeah. have to if the EU needs it You're like wait a minute mm. We just had to reveal that this company did two million dollars worth of GPU training, and we thought they were just a little small company. What's going on, right? Like some something like that could come out. But you know, I I don't know. Something I had in mind is maybe if you create ML models for European citizens, those models must be trained with renewable energy or something to that effect, right? That you don't have to report it. But it, that has to be the case. I don't know. Yeah, it's, but I mean, I don't know. It's it's interesting. This it, it's an interesting question because the thing is, if if you had like you know too many restrictions around this, this would encourage people to like I don't know train less, which then in turn is quite bad. I think actually what's quite important is that like if if you are developing these systems, you should train. You know, at least you know you should care, care about like what you're training, and you shouldn't like you know constantly train these large language models for no reason, just so you can, you know, say, oh, look at my, my model that's bigger than yours. But it is, you know, on a smaller scale, it's very important to keep training your model, to keep collecting data and to keep improving yeah. it and to also train models that are really specific for your problems and not just find something that you download off the internet or that, um, you know, someone gives you via an API that kind of sort of does what you do. And then you're like, ah, that's good enough because that's how you end up with a lot more problems like being right. able to like creating data and being able to train a system for your really really specific use case that's an advantage that's not like um you know a disadvantage that you're trying to avoid yeah or that's a really good point is, yeah it, it could be oh, absolutely in yeah. contrast with some of the other yeah. things like it has to be fair but if it uses too much training that's going to go well, with the other one so let's do less trainings it's kind of close enough yeah. to be unfair right yeah, and then that, that encourages people to use, I don't know, just like some arbitrary API um, that they can find, which again is also, you know, not great. Or like, you know, I, I don't know, I think the, the bigger takeaway or the a very important takeaway from these really large language models, in my opinion, is it's not necessarily that like, whoa, if we just make it bigger and bigger, we could get a system that then can, is pretty good at pretty much everything, considering it's never learned anything about any of these things. I think the takeaway, like, no, and I, I think that many people are still seeing it this way. And I think the more reasonable takeaway is if a model that was just trained on like tons of text can do pretty good um, things with stuff it's never seen before, how well could a much smaller, more specific system do if we actually, you know, trained it on a very, very small subset of only what we want to do? And that will be more efficient. And, you know, I think people, we should stop like, you know, hoping that there'll be one model that can magically do, I don't know, your arbitrary, like, you know, accounting task and also, yeah. um, I don't know, decide whether Michael should get a mortgage or not. Like, I think that's, that's kind of this a weird idea. It's like you want a specific <laughs> yeah. system and that yeah, requires and training. Good, I think training is good. Yeah. Put a good word in with the uh, mortgage AI for me, will you? <laughs> Yeah, then you, I, I think you wanted to have a quick comment on this and maybe we should wrap it up after that. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, I was just going to reference the opportunity and risks of foundation models, which I think touches on uh, some of these things. So it's this mega paper um, and it's exactly, well, well, some of the sections are about exactly this problem of 
Um, like, why do we believe that we need to have these foundational models with these large, extremely large, even larger than the last largest um, models to do all of the things when it also has all these other implications, environmental factors being one of them? Because obviously, when you train one of these models, it's like driving your car around for like 10 years or something like this. So, you know, there's yeah. big implications. And I think the point of can you build a smaller targeted model to do the same thing? And then the other point of if we need these big models, are there ways for us to hook in and do small bits of, bits of training rather than to retrain from the start, from the very beginning? Yep. I mean, these are like the hard problems that mm. I think need solving, not, um, you know, maybe not, uh, maybe not always uh, building a better recommendation machine. So, yeah. Yeah, if you're looking for problems, solve some of these problems. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. This is a, a big article. It, the PDF is is published. People can check it out. We'll link to it in the show notes. Yeah. Also, uh, really actually, quick, point on, yeah, the, on the foundation. Oh, sorry. No, I just wanted to say, sorry, I've been referring to these as language models. I've been trying to re train myself to use the like you know more explicit term because I think foundation models are a much better way um, yeah. to express this. And I'm so happy this term was introduced because it finally solves a lot of these problems of everything being a model um, yeah. that I think causes a lot of confusion when talking about machine learning. Yeah, excellent. Uh, whoops, uh, moving around. Haley asks, what uh, in the audience asks, what does climate change have to do this with this? The reason I brought it up, one, is because Europe seems to be leading, at least in the consensus side of things, trying to address climate change. I feel like there's a lot of citizens there where it's on their mind and, and they they want the government to do something about it and stuff. The governments do a lot there. So as a law, I thought, you know, maybe it would touch on that because Catherine, you pointed out some crazy number. You want to like just reemphasize some of the cost of some of these. Yeah. It's not just like, Oh, well, it's like leaving a few lights on. It's, it's a lot. No, like it's a it's, whole it's lot. huge. Yeah. And they keep getting bigger. I forget who released the newest one. I don't know if you remember Ines, but it's like they keep getting bigger and bigger. So some of yeah. these have like billions and billions and billions of parameters. They sometimes have extremely large amounts of data, um, either as external reference or in the model itself. And uh, yeah, Tivne Gebru's paper that um, essentially she was basically fired from Google for researching was around the, or one of the parts of the paper was around how much carbon uh, emissions come from training these models. They've only gotten bigger since that paper. Um, and yeah, it is, I may have the statistic wrong, but it is as it is almost as bad as driving a car around, you know, with the motor on every day, you know, with your normal commute for like 10 plus years to just train yeah. one model. Yeah. And it's yeah. really absurd because some of these models are just training to prove that we can train them. And so it's like, yeah, what? yeah. And yeah, often yeah. it's not the, the, the artifact isn't even as useful where it's like, OK, with a lot of the bird models, um, um, we can at least I think it's good that we just reuse these weights. And I think often in practice, that's what's done. You know, some you take some of these weights that someone else has trained or use these embeddings and then you train something else on top of that. Um, like transfer you know, using like that. Y yeah. Or even just like you use these embeddings to initialize your um, model and then mm. you train different yeah. components using these um, embeddings and that's yeah. that is efficient but it also means that okay we're kind of stuck with a lot of these like you know artifacts that are getting yeah. um you know stale over time yeah yeah so the comment in the, in the audience was i could train one on my laptop and use electricity like true but it's like fifty yeah. thousand laptops, <laughs> or is, I mean, it's I mean, it's, it's a much. I mean, it's thing. a lot more exactly. No, and I think training on a laptop is great. Like for example, we recently did some work to um, be able to hook into the um, Accelerate library on the um, new M1 uh, MacBooks, which mm -hmm. um, make things a lot faster in Spacey, and that was quite cool to see. And we want to do a bit more there because, like, oh, you can really, you know, if if, if we optimize this further, you can actually train a model on your. MacBook and yeah. um, this can be, be really accurate and you don't necessarily need like all this compute power and yep. Yeah. Yep. So training okay. on laptop I, is good. <laughs> <laughs> it is and yeah. you can do it. But a lot of the ones that we're actually talking about use like these huge, huge modules that take a lot. So n you can say you don't really care about climate change or, or whatever, but if you do, the ML training side has a pretty significant impact and, and I, I was, Unsure whether or not to see it, but yeah, I, I guess it makes sense that it's it's not there. 
who knows? It's also they also they said this is the a foundation for potentially future AI laws in Europe. Yeah, and I also appreciate that. Okay, they didn't want to tie you know tie everything together. Like I can't even I think from a political perspective, if you are proposing this pretty bold um, framework uh, for regulation, um, tying it into too many other topics can easily I don't know distract from like the core point that they want to make. So I think it might have actually been like a you know sure. strategic decision. Yeah, absolutely. All right, ladies, this has been a fantastic conversation i've learned a lot and really enjoyed having you here now before we get out of here maybe since there's two of you and we're sort of over time i'll just ask you one question so the two so if you're going to write some python code what editor are you using these days Catherine, you go first um i i'm still in vim am i old i think i'm old now. <laughs> oh you're classic old. come on oh. <laughs> classic model <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm 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 quite boring. Uh, Visual Studio Code. I've been using that for years. It's right pretty on. nice. I think I think it's probably the most common answer you get, and it's it's quite. Yeah. It's certainly. I mean, actually, using it is a lot edgier and cooler. I wish you know, even for That's maybe right. for that reason alone, I should just like you know okay. switch she to that. Edits so code without even a window; it just appears <laughs> on this black surface. <laughs> I mean, my, my that, he, he programs that way, and I'm like, okay. If it makes you happy, yeah, yeah, you do. You. <laughs> <laughs> Some people just like to suffer. That's okay. Oh, <laughs> All right. No, sorry. No, well, no offense. Like I don't know. Is it, no offense. This was a joke. No offense to anyone who's programming in Vim. I know lots of great people who do that. I don't want to get any hate messages. <laughs> <laughs> Please, <don't even> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, Catherine, Enos, thanks for coming back on the show and sharing your thoughts here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah, thanks for 